Uh, I'm Dr. Amr Khairi, professor of orthopedic and the head of the orthopedic department in Shams University. Uh, dear colleagues all over the world, uh, again from our platform, uh, in Shams platform, we are honored to, to introduce to you in Shams fixed webinar. In our stream of webinars, we used to do weekly every Monday. Uh, this webinar will be run by the food unit, uh, our distinguished food unit, and we'll discuss a crucial subject facing all of us daily in our practice. And the decision making uh, sometimes is difficult. Our subject will be best planners, meet the experts. And here we are, have a lot of experts. I want to welcome first our speakers, uh, Professor Usama Shazli, and I know Usama is the maestro of uh, the whole day and many of our webinars, uh, Professor Mohammed Mukhtar and Professor Amr Farooq, those are our speakers, and it's our owners welcome our international figure, Professor Khafir Martin Oliva from Barcelona University. He is uh, the head of the uh, uh, Scientific Committee of Food and Gang of the European Society. Thank you, Mr. Khafir, we are very honored to meet you and to join us our webinar. Uh, I wish you to have a fruitful night, and I will hand the mic to Professor Atif al the previous head of the foot and the ankle units, and our moderator today, wishing him the best of luck. Dr. Atif, please. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Amr Khairi, our, the head of our department, for his support for all uh, our webinars in Shams webinars. Uh, it's my pleasure to uh, have with us today Dr. Chavi professor in Barcelona University, uh, and my panels will be Professor Dr. Osama Shazli, Professor Dr. Mohammed Mukhtar, and Professor Dr. Amr Farooq. Uh, before uh, we start, we have to tell everybody, كل سنة وانتو طيبين, عيد أضحى مبارك. I asked the, my attendees if they have any notes about the voice or the pictures, they have to uh, let me know through the chat. But if uh, the questions will be at the end of each session uh, on the Q and the A, okay? Uh, we'll start now uh, our session. It will be on base planus. It is uh, a controversial disease. All the disease is controversial as regards the diagnosis, causes, treatment, non-operative, operative, even in the operative treatment, there is a debate. So uh, we will try in this uh, webinar to clarify uh, important points and tips and tricks in peace planners, diagnosis and treatment. Uh, we'll start now with Dr. Chaffee from Barcelona University. Uh, he will present to us two cases about tibialis posterior dysfunction, adult acquired flat feet. Dr. Chaffee. Thank you. Thank you. It's an honor for me to share this uh, webinar with the professors Am, Amr, Atef, and my dear friends, uh, Osama, Mokhtar, and also uh, Am, Am Farouk. Very good friends for a long time, and it's a, it's a really honor to share here uh, your uh, session. I will try to share the screen. Wait a minute. Uh, work here. Now, okay. Could you see? Yeah. Could you see yeah, this thing? Yeah, for FaceTime, the audio. Oh, uh, yes, we can see. It's okay? Yes. Oh, good. Good. I, I will present two cases about uh, this pathology, the tibial posterior tendon dysfunction, that this is one of the types of uh, adult flat foot, but in our practice in Barcelona, perhaps in Egypt is not so uh, this, the same situation, but in Barcelona is the most frequently cause of adult, adult flat foot. Only I want to remind you before the two cases, the Johnson classification about the tibial posterior tendon dysfunction. The stage one is a, only a tenosynovitis of the tendon and the hind foot is flexible and the patients have pain and tenderness in the 
area of the tibial posterior tendon. The stage two, the time for deformity is in valgus, of course, but the subalar joint is still flexible. The stage three, there are also a hind foot deformity in valgus, but however, the subtalar joint is rigid and degenerative. And finally, Meyerson add to this classification the stage four, and in the stage four, the hind foot, the hind foot deformity is also in valgus with a rigid subtalar, but with affectation of the ankle joint and deltoid ligament. These are the four stages of this function of tibial posterior tendon. The case one is a patient, a man, 52 years old. In the last three years, present important pain in sinus tarsi and in the medial part of the hind foot, and also pain in the tibial posterior tendon with an atrophy of the gastrocnemius muscle. The subtalar joint in the examination of the patient is flexible, is not uh, still is not a stiff subtalar joint. This is the examination. You could see a moderate abduction of the mid and forefoot and the sing of too many toes, but moderate sing of too many toes, but you could see in this picture. In the high rise test, uh, you could see how the patient with the high rise test correct the valgus of the hind foot. It means that the tibial posterior tendon have, has a quite normal function. And you could see here the video of the correction with the high rise test. You could see another time the, how the patient correct the hind foot of the, uh, the, the, the valgus of the hind foot. This is the uh, the ambulation, the gait of the patient. Some difficulty for to uh, perform the the gait for the secondary to this hind foot in valgus position. It's a long evolution in this position, and I have some questions for the webinar participants. Uh, could uh, you say uh, an answer to the chat which? Uh, what stage of this deltibial posterior tendon did the patient have? Could you uh, collect the answer of these questions uh, or not? Uh, yes, I will collect it, yes. Okay. Please uh, answer it on the chat, okay? Answer this on the chat. What stage of this deltibial posterior tendon dysfunction did the patient uh, the answers start to uh, mostly the stage two. Uh, there is some uh, colleagues stage one, stage two, two. Stage the second two. question is why? Please say why. Okay, Do you think please why on the chat also? Uh, flexible subtalar. Yes, this correct. Is, this is one of the answer. Free subtalar is the same. Correctable is the same, flexible subtalar, because it is correctable, correctable yeah. hind foot, can perform heel rise. Good. This is, uh, this, is now, correct, yes. this is the correct answer. We, we present uh, a stage two, and the answer to why is because the subtalar is still flexible. This is I, the, have yeah. a, I have a comment to Chavi for this. Yes, uh, because the stage one also is a subtalar is movable and uh, the patient can do heel rise test. But we differentiate stage one from two by the location of pain. In stage one, pain is medial yeah. with genus synovitis mainly. But in this particular patient, you have to mention that the pain is lateral and the patient yeah. start to have sub sinusal side pain. So this is a differentiation between one and the two. Yeah. Right. I have, okay. uh, uh, also sorry, Osama, I, I want to tell one thing. Wine, uh, wine, there are not so severe deformity of the hind foot. Yeah, yeah. Dr. Chavi, one second. Uh, yeah. The difference between stage one and stage two, the deformity, Osama. Stage one, yeah. there is no deformity at all, just pain and swelling. Like stage two, the deformity starts to uh, appear mm -hmm. and it is correctable or flexible. 
It's Thank very, you. Okay, Dr. Very Dr. moderate Chaffee. deformity. Stage one is very moderate deformity, soft clinical, not pain in the lateral part of the ankle. Yeah. Yes. Only okay, can you view the gait of this patient, you could uh, think that is not a stage one. Only looking the, the gait of the patient. Okay. Yes. Okay. Possibilities to treatment. Different possibilities, subtalar to disease plus flexor digital lungs transfer, atroresis, calcaneal osteotomy plus flexor digitus longus transfer, flexor digitus longus transfer plus arthrodesis, arthrodesis results. Before I told you arthrodesis, now is arthrodesis, subtalar and ankle fusion, and calcaneal osteotomy. Please, on the chat, the answers. There is calcanean osteotomy. This is the first uh, answer. Calcanean osteotomy plus flexor digitorum longus transfer. Calcanean osteotomy. Number three, answer number three. Mm -hmm. Calcanean osteotomy. Again, calcanean osteotomy. Again, number three. The, the answer is between three and six, no? Yes. yes. Yeah. Okay. Uh, okay. My treatment was calcaneal osteotomy isolated. And I will explain why. Because we always perform before the TBL uh, posterior treatment about the calcaneal osteotomy, we perform a tenoscopy. And you could see usually in most of 95% of these patients with the stage two, that the hind foot could be correct in the heel test rise, we observe the conservation of the tibial posterior tendon without ruptures. It's very exceptional to find ruptures in the stage two. In this sense, we only treat the position of the heel and we don't treat the uh, soft tissue in the medial part of the hind foot, okay? Shalvi, I have a question here. Yes. Uh, should, should we, re if, if, if the surgeon is not able to do tenoscopy because it's a technically demanding procedure, can he rely on clinical picture and MRI, uh, MRI. To diagnose stage two and then he would perform <laughs> Two, two things. The first, the heel test rise, yeah. correcting the position. It means yeah. that the posterior tibial tendon is working. Yeah. First point. Second yeah. point, MRI. Okay? MRI. Yeah. MRI could help you a lot of in the diagnosis of uh, normality of the posterior tibial tendon. But Great. in Thank most you. of the cases in the stage two, there are conservative of the posterior tibial tendon. It yeah. means that it's not necessary because the medial uh, soft tissue treatment have more complication after never the flexor digitus longus have the same function of the posterior tibial tendon. And for yeah. us, the architecture, the position of the uh, hind foot for us is fundamental more than the soft tissue, more than the tendon function. And especially if we perform a transfer and also okay. the transfers means complications in the treatment. Yeah. And Thank we you. observe perfect results only with the calcaneal osteotomy uh, treatment. Perfect, yes. In a stage two, of course. Yeah. Okay, uh, the technique is a passion in lateral decubitus, uh, two centimeters posterior lateral to the maleolus, we perform the incision parallel to the peroneal te tendons. Be careful with sural nerve. The osteotomy must be perpendicular to calcaneal axis, and it means 45 degrees with regard to the patient's sole. This is the line of the osteotomy. If it is difficult after the osteotomy, take care with the medial cortical part of the calcaneus. Pay attention because the uh, bundle structures are close to the medial part of the calcaneus. And after that, it is difficult after to perform the osteotomy to transfer the osteotomy, place the foot of the, in the kinetic position. 
these are rigs that would be easier for to obtain one centimeter of displacement. It's important to obtain one centimeter of displacement. After achieve the correction, the ankle is put to 90 degrees, managing to maintain the correction of the one centimeter of displacement. This is also a small, uh, small trick for to maintain the correction. We need, is important, I remind you, we need to obtain one centimeter of medial displacement. And for this objective, it's important that the cut is made perpendicular to the calcaneal axis. This is also a small trick to be very perpendicular to the calcaneal axis. After to obtain the correction, the, the one centimeter of correction, you could use any key wire to fix the correction. And after that, you could see the direction of the screws, if the direction of the screws is correct, and if it's correct through the key wire, you could introduce the cannulet screws. Always is important the uh, control by X-ray, and always try to avoid the subtalar joint with your screws. You could use plate, but I think there are not advantages to use plate. They are more expensive, and you'd have not more correction or more um, more uh, uh, important things to obtain with the with the plate. For me, two screws is perfect for obtaining good uh, reduction and good correction and good fixation. I, I have a question, Chad. Yes. Uh, yes. Do you all would just make uh, medial translation? Or sometimes you make inferior displacement as well to improve the yeah. calcinian pitch angle, like the original Kustiniagis technique, I mean. Yeah. Usually not. I only uh, perform uh, translation, not, not uh, translation. No different. Yeah. Yeah. Really. yeah. Not in okay. my practice, no. Okay. In some Thank patients, you. in this stage too, there are some patients with a component of abduction. In these cases, you need to perform either osteotomy, isolated, or associated the calcaneal displacement of osteotomy with the EVANS. But I don't talk about EVANS because my colleagues will explain better indications and how to do different types of EVANS osteotomy. Only know that in some stage two, it's necessary to correct if the component of adduction is better to correct with an EVANS or associating displacement and osteotomy and events, both. This is the result of the case that I show you, and this is the final results of this uh, calcaneal displacement osteotomy. You could observe that the patient present a very nice subtalar joint and it's not necessary to perform any uh, surgery uh, about uh, thinking about atrodesis. A stage two calcaneal osteotomy because, because the subtalar joint is healthy still, okay? Okay. We could observe the correction of the valgus of the hind, fight, hind foot with the uh, calcaneal osteotomy displacement. You could observe the difference uh, before the, 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 the surgery and after the surgery, the position of the hind foot. And this is the case one. Okay. Any questions about this case? Yes, please. I have a question, Dr. Xavi, please. Yes. Uh, is the deformity of this patient is long-standing deformity or he had normal alignment and then started to get the vulgar deformity? No, it's a history of a long history of progressive uh, deformity of the, in the hind foot. Was well, well tolerated with soles to the, some years, but in the last three years started problems also with, uh, with insoles. Okay, and if the patient can do uh, the single heel rise test uh, and the deformity is not acquired, why don't you consider this as stage one? Stage one? Yes. Uh, because the tendon is functioning and the deformity is long standing, so it's not. No, but, uh, but, but the. The, the, the deformity in stage one, you never observe this deformity. You could, uh, you mm. could see now, wait a minute. Yes, but the but, deformity for me is not an stage one. And okay. the stage one is a very, very 
soft deformity, very moderate deformity, and the, the, cl the clinical examination of the patient with the stage one is pain in the uh, traject, in, the, in, in all the uh, direction of the tibial posterior tendon with mm. tenderness, is a tenosynovitis uh, uh, stage, but it's not a stage of deformity. Okay. The deformity of the hind foot like this. If the patient have this deformity acquired and the tendon is okay, um, how do you diagnose or exclude that the, the, this cause of the deformity is a string ligament injury? Yeah. Uh, could be an addition of a spring ligament uh, lesion, of course. With MRI, you have some information, but it's very strange uh, at a spring uh, ligament lesions with an intact tibial posterior tendon. It's not often. And we always perform a tenoscopy before mm. to check the... Uh, uh, the, the condition of the tibial posterior tendon, okay? And I think we never repair in this patient in stage two, the uh, spring ligament. We never open- You, you never do this? The, there is a lot of controversies in the meeting, Dr. Chavi, about the need to do something for the spring ligament in stage two. What's yeah. your experience in this? No, nah. my experience is with, without perform medial soft tissue reparation in these patients. The result is very good if you obtain a normal architecture of the hind foot, bone okay. architecture. The position of the hind foot in relation with the bones is much, much, much important than the soft tissue in these patients. Okay. Really. Because also that, and another argument, if you perform a flexor digitus longus transfer, it's very, there are different papers talking about the soft uh, strength of the flexor digitus longus in relation with the function of the tibial posterior tendon. It's very, very uh, few uh, strengths, the uh, transfer with flexor digitus longus. Mm. And we have, uh, now a long experience only performing bone uh, procedures and the results are very, very good. The important is to obtain the correction of the hind foot. This is very important. The architecture, that yeah, is fundamental. Thank you very much for this but, nice discussion. But this is, is uh, I know it's controversial. Eh? There are some uh, colleagues that wanted always re, uh, perform the soft tissue procedures eh? associated. But if in most of the 95% you obtain, you, you see the tendon normally. Why open the, the, the tendon? Why open the sheath of the tendon? Which is the reason in the stage two? I think it has not sense. Okay, okay thank you. Um, during genoscopy, uh, what is the difference between the healthy and the unhealthy tendon during the tenoscopy? Is it a matter of viewing the tendon or uh, do you do also palpation of the tendon using yeah. the new yes? Yeah, you could introduce a, a crochet. Crochet is uh, the hook. You could touch the tendon, but uh, usually you, 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 you see the integrity of the tendon. In some cases in a stage two, you could see uh, some, uh, uh, how you say, some partial lesion, some uh, uh, synovitis, synovitis surrounding the tendon, no? But uh, at maximum, you need to clean a little bit. This is also a, a, an, an another good point because some patients have pain in the tibial posterior tendon. If you clean the tendon a little bit with the uh, shaver, you, the patients also improve a lot of, of the clinical of uh, tendinitis associated in, the, in this stage. But after that, important is to uh, take a solution with the architecture to put the hind foot well alignment. Chevy, uh, we have a few questions from our audience, Chevy. I will choose uh, two or three of them. Uh, the first one, uh, in stage two, is the tibialis posterior tendon is ruptured or not? In stage one and stage two? 
two, yes, he asked about no. stage two. Usually more than 90% not, then it's not, not present a rupture. But the, the diagnosis is with the high test rise. If the tendon is present a rupture, the patient can't correct the hind foot valgus in the high rise test. Okay, uh, another question is, in stage two, if you will do just calcaneal osteotomy, what yeah. about the pathology of the tibialis posterior tendon? Uh, he asked about uh, it will be the cause of pain after the operation. So you don't attack the tibialis posterior tendon at all. Yes, I told you, we always perform the tendoscopy and I think we clean a little bit the, the sheath of the tendon and if there are some sign of it is we clean. And I think with the, with the cleaning of the sheath and with the serum cleaning of the sheath and with the shave uh, clean a little bit is enough and the patients improve a lot of, of the clinical of tendinitis. But of course, the most important is to correct the hind foot in valgus because after the after the the ten, uh, tenoscopy and calcaneal osteotomy we place a place a plaster during three four weeks and with the rest of the hind foot the correction of the hind foot position and the cleaning of the sheath the patients improve a lot with this uh, technique with the calcaneal osteotomy isolated yeah the last question yeah. is what uh, x-ray view you used intraoperatively? Both lateral and axial view, always, for to see, for to see the, the screws, no? Yes, the okay. The is fundamental for the position of the screws, but also, also is, is necessary to perform an axial view, okay? For don't... Okay, for a, you can shift now to, to your a, second case. Difficult to perform a mistake with the screws, but pay attention with the screws. What, what is the diameter of the screws, please? The diameter uh, of the... Four, uh, three, four, uh, three, four, five, four, uh, four point five millimeters. Three point five? Two, four point five. Okay. The small one of the sets on hind foot. Yeah. Never the six point... Uh, five or seven. This, the six and the seven are for the subtalar artrodesis, not for the calcaneal osteotomy. I prefer to use two small one, but not one big in the calcaneal osteotomy. Because two screws is better for to avoid the rotation of the calcaneal osteotomy. Okay, I, I you can shift to the time, Please shift to the second case, please, Dr. Kavir. Yes. Uh, uh. yes. Uh. This is a woman, 74 years old. The hind foot presents a severe deformity. The patient has some uh, uh, associated pathology, high blood pressure, oral antidiabetic. She used insult in the last 23 years. And in the last four years, she increased severe deformity in the hind foot. And in the last 12 months, severe pain in the posterior tibial tendons and in the lateral part of the ankle joint. Not improving with conservative treatment. We treat conservative always the patient before the surgery. And in the examination, we observe a subtalar rigid and we perform the high rise test. You could see. <laughs> Difficult to perform the high test and don't correct the valgus of the hind foot, okay? These yeah. the pictures with uh, arthritis in the subtalar joint and in the chopar joint and also in the talo and the cuneo navicular joint. And questions for the webinar participants. What stage of distal tibial posterior tendon dysfunction did the patient have? I think- Please answer on the chat. Probably most of the people could say the correct stage answer. Three, stage three, stage four, three, three. Why? Three. Why, please? Rigid one, subtil. Four, one, four. Stage three, three, four. Please, why? Answer why. Especially the guys that answer stage four. 
Yes, Dr. Mohammed Farouk, please tell us why it is stage four. The rest are saying is stage three. I think it's a stage three because the ankle joint is still. Uh, I, I think I Chavi, Chavi, they, they are, there are some confusion between the audience between the presence of subtalar arthritis and stage four. So they think that stage four have subtalar arthritis. But stage four is a fiction of the deltoid ligaments and the ankle joint. It's not this related to the subtalar arthritis. This is stage yeah. four. So okay. this is stage three, yeah. Could you see, could you see stage four? Yeah. Could yeah. you read? Eh? It's the high the... with valgus with rigid subtalar, but affectation of the ankle joint and deltoid ligament. Yeah. Okay. So I, I, I think the message is clear to our attendants now. When you have ankle affection, it's a stage four. When you have subtalar arthritis, but no ankle affection, it's still stage three. Okay. Exactly. 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 Okay, carry on. It's okay. Are you agree okay. that it's a stage three? Yeah. Agree. Possibility of treatment, subtalar and ankle fusion, calcaneal osteotomy isolated, calcaneal osteotomy and flexor digitus longus transfer, subtalar plus chopar fusion is a double arthrodesis, or Evans plus cotton. One minute for answers on the chat, please. Number four, double arthrodesis, subtalar and chopart arthrodesis. Number four, number four, number four, four. I think all the answers fall. Double arthrodesis, double arthrodesis. Good. Double okay. arthrodesis, four. I think yeah. uh, all of the audience I mean, there are, are so intelligent. Much with the double arthrodesis, okay? Yeah. Yes, this is our option. To, uh, we, we choose a double arthrodesis. Possibilities for to perform the double arthrodesis. Uh, the uh, classical one is uh, the lateral uh, incision plus a medial incision. Lateral incision for subtalar and calcaneo cuboid joint and medial incision for uh, talonavicular. This is the classical one. The second possibility is only one medial incision and perform by medial approach subtalar joint and talonavicular joint, uh, missing the calcaneo cuboid joint. And the third possibility is the treatment that we use nowadays in the last years. It means a lateral incision for the subtalar joint and an anterior medial approach for the talonavicular joint. We need calcaneo cuboid joint after I will explain why. This is the lateral joint, uh, the lateral incision. You could observe the posterior uh, surface of the subtalar joint. We remove the cartilage, of course. After that, we perform an anterior incision. Is the, the classical anterior approach for the ankle joint, but a small one more uh, short anterior medial approach only to identify the anterior tibial tendon you could see here and between the anterior tibial tendon and the extensor alysis longus we uh, find the space to arrive to the uh, talonavicular joint you could see here very good view of the talonavicular joint better than for medial sometimes by the medial approach is difficult to observe all the talonavicular joint, but for this anterior talonavicular approach is very nice view of the joint. Uh, also, uh, we try, we attempt to correct the supination of the forefoot with the talonavicular disease by moderate lowering of the internal arch. You could see why I explain you this now. Uh, think about the cotton possibilities, but Okay, we always, we perform the talonavicular. We try to correct a little bit, if it's possible, the supination of the forehead. Not always is possible. Eh? Because why? Because after double arthrodesis, we always need to, we need to check if the forefoot virus is higher than 10 degrees. Because in this 
way we need to perform a cotton osteotomy to correct this virus of the forefoot. For this reason, we try to correct, if it's possible, a little bit this supination of the forefoot, lowering a little bit with the talonavicular arthrodesis. If it's uh, moderate, uh, the, this, uh, this uh, position of the internal art with a moderate lowering, you could avoid the cotton osteotomy. But I don't want to speak about the cotton osteotomy because my colleagues after they will explain better the possibilities of the cotton osteotomy. Only the idea is the after the subtalar, uh, the double arthrodesis, subtalar and tarnavicular, you always check the forefoot position. This is necessary. You need to perform some correction as cotton uh, surgery. And for the flat foot hindfoot arthrodesis, we never, we don't perform never calcan cuboid arthrodesis nowadays. In the past, we perform it, but nowadays we only perform double arthrodesis, respect the calcaneo cuboid joints. Why? Because it helps to correct the midfoot abduction if you respect the calcaneo cuboid joint. And also, we avo avoid the non union of the arthrodesis of calcaneo cuboid joint, that this is quite often complication of the calcaneo cuboid arthrodesis. And for the correction of the flat foot, correction of the dysfunction of tibial posterior tendon is not necessarily the arthrodesis of calcaneo cuboid joint. For the cavus foot, it's important to perform the triple arthrodesis, but the, for the flat foot, it's not necessary to perform the calcaneo cuboid joint. This is the uh, final um, result after to perform the uh, synthesis of the subtalar joint and the talonavicular joint. You could see here the picture. Okay. Any questions? Uh, okay, thank you a lot, uh, Dr. Chavi, for your fruitful uh, presentation. Uh, there is one question is, in heel race test, you do it uh, in a single limb or bilateral? It's better. Uh, I, I, I do bilateral, but some colleagues think it's better to do single high rise test. No? It's some time of, of controversy. But if, if the patient correct bilateral or single, you could see perfectly if there are uh, function of the tibial posterior tendon or not. Okay, thank you. Thank you a lot. Uh, you want to ask Am? Fadal Am. You start by fixing the telonavicular joint first or the subtalar? Yeah, this is always there are controversy about this. I prefer to start with the talonavicular joint, but some colleagues prefer to start with the subtalar joint. I think there are not really important difference, eh? but in my practice, I always start fixing provisionally with a key wire, the talon avicular. After to fixing provisionally with a key wire, I fix with key wire, the subtalar joint. After I will check by a uh, floor scan. And if I like the position, I use the cannula screws. Okay, I think now we have to shift to Professor Osama Shazli. Uh, he will uh, present uh, two cases of peace plan of valgus, flexible peace plan of valgus, to do an arthroiresis or Evans uh, procedure. Okay, okay thank Professor. you, uh, Dr. Atif, uh, very much for your uh, moderation. And thanks, Chavi, for uh, giving a good, good presentation about uh, adult acquired flat foot. Uh, now we will move uh, to another form of flat foot, uh, which is flexible flat foot. And I want my, the audience to uh, receive this take home message about the difference in management uh, between adult acquired flat foot and uh, flexible flat foot in adolescence. And uh, now uh, I will present this case. This is 12 years old female, bilateral foot pain on walking. And uh, as you have seen in the lecture of Chave, I would Sorry, like Sam, to... Sam, Sorry, Yes. I, I hear the, uh, there is a voice beside you. You open the... Okay, now it's okay? Yes, okay. No. Okay. So I would like to ask uh, the audience now, as you have seen in the previous lecture, what are the positive signs you see here now? You can write on the chat. You can see here what kind of signs you see here. We will move 
quickly, so just write, please. Two many toe signs, this is very good. Uh, we can see it more on the right side. We have also collapse of medial arch and we have significant valgus here, so you are right and correct. Uh, uh, you have seen the heel rise test with the Chavi. Could you tell me please, what is the name of this test you see right now? I will show you again here. What is the name of this test? Can you write in the chat box, please? Uh, yes, no. yes. This is Jack's test, right? The Jack's yes. test is one of the tests also, not only the heel rise test, which differentiates flexible from non-flexible flat foot. This test, Jack test, also differentiates between flexible and non-flexible. Uh, some of you have written an answer here, which I like it also, uh, but I will transform it in a question to you. What do you think, which structure is responsible for this Jack's test? Uh, is it the uh, uh, flexor halus longus tendon, or is it the windless effect of plantar fascia, or is it the tibialis posterior integrity, or finally, is it the long plantar ligament? Right, it is a windless effect of plantar fascia because all you, you know that the plantar fascia is attached to basis of flanges, so we make dorsiflexion of toes, there is regaining of the arch again. Another test which differentiates flexible from non-flexible uh, uh, fl flat foots in a children uh, is this test. Did you hear about this test? It's heel rocking test. In this test, while the patient is still standing and repairing on the full foot, you just ask the patient to rock his heel medially and laterally as you see here. So you can move it like that. If the patient can do that, this is flexible flat foot and this is named the heel rocking test. And uh, what is the structure which is responsible for this function? Is it flexor halsus or Achilles or TPIs posterior or flexor digitorum longus? Can you answer in chat box? Some of you had written Achilles. No, it's of course a TPIs posterior tendon. So uh, these are adding tests for you to differentiate between the flexible and non-flexible types. So uh, uh, in the x-rays, as we, as we have seen with Chavi, we depend on uh, standing views uh, always, uh, whether it is a standing anthroposterior view or the standing lateral views. In the anthroposterior view, we have to rely on the measurements, uh, which helps you to diagnose the severity of the deformity, one of them, is the uh, Taylor axis, first metatarsal axis angle. And normally this is zero angle and they are in line. When you have separation like that, it denotes that we have four foot abduction as well as we have also a uh, valgus heel. Uh, in this patient, we have 10 degrees on the right side and we have 20 degrees on the left side. Uh, do you need any other angles in the anthroposterior view? Any view knows uh, if there is another angle which is important to measure in the anthroposterior view, please write it in the chat box if you know it. Yes, telonavicular coverage. Thank you, Omar. Thank you very much. It is the telonavicular coverage. It's the degree of how much of the telus is covered by the navicular. And this angle, we can do it by measuring the angle between the perpendiculars of the articular surface of the navicular and the talus. You took line between the two points of articular surface of talus and the same for the navicular and you take the perpendiculars. If you see these perpendiculars, uh, 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 normally there is angle zero here, which means total coverage. But if the angle increase, it indicates that there is telonavicular uncoverage. The telonavicular uncoverage or the, uh, uh, is denoting for the severity of forefoot abduction. And if the patient have uh, more than 40 degree of uh, telonavicular uncoverage, this is a cutting number uh, for the management plan, which we will mention later on. And you will see also with the presentation of my colleague, Mohammed Mukhtar. In the standing lateral views, we have also another angle, is three angles. This may angle between the axis of the talus and axis of the first metatarsal in the lateral view. And my question to you, what increases the Mary's angle in flat foot deformities? And please choose from the MCQ. Is it the 
spring ligament stretch is the plantar ligamentous stretch is it the external rotation and medial subluxation of tiller head or is it all of the above I think the golden rule when you have MCQ with all of the above, you have to choose all of the above, of course. This is a golden rule in all MCQ. So all of these uh, changes which happens in the medial soft tissue structures will increase the merry angle of the patient. Okay, I want to uh, focus on the spring ligament as my colleague Muhammad Mukhtar has mentioned. It's very important structure in supporting the tailor head uh, losing the integrity of uh, the uh, spring ligament will increase the severity of flat foot deformity. Uh, and uh, sometimes we need to repair it in some cases of flexible flat, flat, uh, flat foot deformity or even with adult acquired flat foot deformity. The spring ligament extends between the navicular and sustentaculum. It forms with the facets of the calcaneus, what we call it acetabulum bedis as in the photo of Glano, and it have some variations uh, here. Sometimes it's three bands and sometimes it's two bands. We have uh, uh, discussed this before in many of our lectures of uh, uh, fl uh, flat foot and uh, how it's important in supporting the arch. Uh, so now we have uh, this patient with this telonavicular and coverage on the uh, right side and in the left side and this Mary's angle of 20 degree. And my question to you, what's your plan of management? I give you options as usual. Would you go for medial displacement calcanean osteotomy for this patient? Would you go for advanced osteotomy or lateral column lengthening? Uh, would you go for arthroeresis? Uh, or would you go for flexor digitorum longus uh, transfer with medial soft tissue reconstruction? So you can choose your answers. I see now most of you choose uh, uh, between two and three. Some of you choose events osteotomy. Uh, some of you choose uh, arthroeresis. So my, my, to, my question to the panel, uh, Dr. Uh, panel, uh, uh, why, why, uh, who would go for medial displacement calcinian osteotomy for this patient? Mm -hmm. Mukhtar and uh, Dr. Andra and Dr. Chavi, uh, any of you like to answer? if you would like to do medial displacement calcinian osteotomy for this patient. Start? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, okay, uh, I think in, in, in this patient, if I would do an osteo osteotomy, bony correction, not arthroiresis, uh, I would start with, the, with lateral column lengthening. Uh, and then if the valgus is still there or the valgus is severe, not, not well corrected with the lateral column lengthening, I would go for a medial translation calcaneal osteotomy. Uh, this is because if you try to correct severe valgus and significant forefoot abduction by one osteotomy, you will, you will, you will have to make distraction more than one centimeter. And this is contraindicated. The maximal, the ideal uh, length of the wedge of the uh, distraction is eight millimeter, may increase to one centimeter, but more than one centimeter, there will be impingement between the graft and the posterior facet because the, the posterior facet of the talus and the calcaneus will not be congruent. Uh, this is proved by Mark Meyerson study. So I will put a wedge of eight to nine millimeter for the events. And then if the patient still has valgus, I will add a medial translation calcaneal osteotomy. And th at the end, I will uh, test the gastrocnemius uh, type. What's, uh, well, what's uh, the opinion of my other? I agree, I agree with this. Eh? Started with the events. If you uh, don't correct the hind foot, you need to add uh, okay. medial uh, calcaneal. Uh, Okay, great. So you prefer events because uh, not displaced, medial displacement calcanean because the patient has four foot abduction. So events will give you a better option for lateral column lensing. What about arthroiresis, Chabi? Yeah. Do you think arthroiresis is a valid option for such case? Uh, it's an option. It's an option, of course. It's an option. Okay. But I understand, so, but I understand better to correct the valgus of the hind foot without uh, work inside the joint. 
I know yeah. that the, the sinus tarsi is not a really joint, but is a yeah. space with a very important uh, proprioceptive uh, terminations, nerve yeah. termination, and I prefer don't uh, disturb these uh, structures of the sinus tarsi. And I feel more anatomic to correct the hind foot valgus with an osteotomy extra, extra articular than not with a, a, a one instrumentation inside the sinus tarsi for me. Okay. Uh, Mohammed, uh, yeah, your opinion about this? Can, can I? Amr Farouk. Amr Farouk. Dr. Osama. Uh, yeah. The choice of arthroesis of arthroesis here, um, not only because it may be in may affect the joint, but because this patient has significant forefoot abduction, so I need to choose uh, an option that combines the correction of hind foot deformity yeah. plus forefoot abduction, and I, yeah. I think the corrective power of arthroesis to correct the forefoot abduction in addition to correcting the hind foot deformity is, is yeah. less than uh, the Evans osteotomy. So uh, if I could very, very good. This is very good, Am. You addressed a very important point uh, that uh, Evans osteotomy can help to correct forefoot abduction better than arthroesis. So now we may, I, I may ask Muhammad Mukhtar for a question about uh, is there is a cutting value or number? This is what we have mentioned. What is the power of arthroesis to correct forefoot abduction? Uh, can arthroesis correct forefoot abduction or not? Okay, I, I will I will uh, say about the literature and in my experience. So in a case like this, the telonavicular uncoverage is not bad as the patient is 12 years old. So in this patient, arthroesis is good. Okay, yeah. uh, arthroesis in my experience and in the literature, uh, is is weaker in correcting forefoot abduction than in correcting the valgus, but it corrects some forefoot abduction. Uh, if the patient has uh, forefoot abduction and hind foot valgus, and the angle is up to 40, maybe something, I can still use arthroesis. Uh, but uh, the, the it's not only the degree of teronavicular uncoverage. There is another point. If the patient has no valgus, no valgus, and the deformity is primarily forefoot abduction, in these cases, arthroeresis doesn't work well. So I agree that the arthroeresis has limited ability to correct forefoot, uh, forefoot abduction than arthroeresis, but sometimes partial correction is enough for the patient to be asymptomatic if the primary deformity is, is valgus, is hind foot valgus. Thank you very much. You but, have concluded the message of I want to say that uh, uh, both events and arthroesis can be alternative when you have four foot abduction, which is mild, less than 40 degrees or telonavicular uncoverage, and you have also valgus here. If you have purely four foot abduction, you have to do events osteotomy. If you have purely valgus here, you have to think in osteotomies more. And actually, this is what I had uh, done uh, for this patient. I did for him arthroesis. And I would like to ask, in this case, what is the role of arthroesis? What should it do? Uh, arthroesis, how it helps? Of course, arthroesis have two rules. First, it causes mechanical block for the uh, subtalar joint uh, from going in too much aversion position. The second, it improves the proprioception of the ligaments, of the lateral ligaments, and also for the reflexes of the pronei. So it prevents the uh, subluxation of the subtalar joint. And this may answer the question, what happens if we remove the, the arthroesis later on? Shall the patient have recurrence of the deformity or not? In most of cases, the recurrence is minimal because the ligaments adapt the new position and also the proprioceptive function improves this. And this is what we have done to the patient. This is uh, the technique. Usually, I make small incision like that over the sinus side. My question to the panel as well, uh, do you do it percutaneous, purely percutaneous, or you like to make a small exposure to the sinus side? Chavi. Small incision, small, small, small exposition. 
But it's another really point important, yeah, another point important is for me, the arthritis is only the indication is the child's. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Although Never some the data write about the adult acquired flat foot, but still the results are not uh, approved and there are many complications for that. So I agree with you. I only use arthritis for children. Never I do yeah. it for adults. Right. I think it's a good uh, indication for children. It's a very good indication for children, not for adults. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Okay. My comment, so my I, anterior I, comment, is in relation with the adults, okay? Yeah. But not with the child. Eh? So uh, I do like this child. I, I, I always with the adults. Yeah. Uh, I open the sinus tarsi, I deprive it, so I can easily see it, and I can see the screw when I put it. I put the wire, and I have to check the position of the wire inside the sinus tarsi. I'm sorry. I'm sorry for that. Okay. Then I put the wire like that, and I check the position of the wire in the uh, image intensifier. Then we use uh, uh, the dilators. These reimers or dilators has different sizes. Uh, and you can choose the proper size and the distance of uh, uh, reaming. You shouldn't cross more than half uh, the uh, uh, axis of the telus. So you don't go far medial. You don't cross the axis of the telus. You have to stop here. And usually this takes about 25 milli uh, degrees. Uh, my, may, yeah. may I have a question, please? Uh, what is yeah. the proper size? Well, uh, when well, you decide the proper size, this is why okay. I make a small incision and I have to look to the posterior facet because well, uh, if you put a bigger size and you will start well, to yeah. distract yeah. the posterior facet, this will be a very complex, uh, it will do a complication. So what's your opinion? Well, as regards yeah. sizing? Okay, the sizing depends on uh, two factors. Uh, number one is your clinical sense when you apply it. I put the uh, uh, size that doesn't go so strongly with the reamer. I feel it usually it's a 10 or maximum maybe 11. I never cross more than 11, but I depend on my feeling when I do reaming. If I have too much resistance, I take the under size uh, for the reamer. The second is radiological. When you do it with the lateral view, you have to check the subtalar joint. You shouldn't make too much distraction in the subtalar joint. If you have distraction subtalar joint, this means you have oversized the reamer. Uh, this is my in my hands here. So if, yes, if anyone in the panel has another tips, you, he can tell you. Mukhtar, did you have uh, any tips? No, I agree with Dr. Osama. Usually, I use 10 to 10 or 11 size, uh, and I feel that it's it's fit. It's the, the 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 trial is not very loose in the sinus tarsi and not very tight. I agree with this, and also I check that the valgus, the heel valgus, with the trial inside, doesn't exceed five degrees of valgus, and the dorsiflexion of the foot is not associated with eversion. So when the ankle is in, in, in the hind foot is in, in valgus, when you do dorsiflexion, the foot goes in eversion with dorsiflexion. When the axis of dorsiflexion is right, is in pure dorsiflexion or need a pure dorsiflexion, and the ankle valgus doesn't go beyond five, then I think this is the right size. Okay. Well, okay. Uh, then after I make reaming, I bought the proper screw, as I told you. The screw usually is... Uh, uh, 10 or maximum, maybe 11 uh, screw in most of cases. Uh, now I check the dorsiflexion, and if I have, there is a residual aquinas, I do either percutaneous lengthening of tendon Achilles or gastrocnemius uh, recession. And also my uh, question to the panel, how frequent do you do tendon Achilles lengthening or uh, gastrocnemius recession with cases of flexible flat foot? So, so Chavi, if you if you want to answer, quite 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 often, quite often. Always, always I feel that is tightening. I think if you yeah, feel it's uh, tightening. You don't achieve night degrees. You need to perform. And Amr Faru, uh, which one do you prefer, uh, uh, gastrocnemius or percutaneous lengthening? It, it's according to the silver scroll test, but in most cases of uh, of flexible flat foot, 
I think uh, gastrocnemius recession is more than tendon Achilles lengthening. More common. Yeah, sure. It depends on cell breast quite test. I agree with you. So uh, we did for this patient uh, uh, tendon Achilles lengthening because it was tight and it's part of the deforming force. And now this is a correction of the patient. Here is the X-ray view. You see the uh, sinus tarsi is fitting in the sinus tarsi properly and we have no much distraction. And here is the alignment of the patient is very nice as you see here and he can stand tiptoeing properly. As this is the first case, uh, I will move to the second, uh, another, uh, just one question before, uh, because I, I, I usually have this question from the patients and uh, from the, uh, also the participants in webinars. Should we remove this implant or not? So my question to the panel, do you frequently remove uh, this webinar or this uh, implant or not? Mm. Yeah, Mukhtar. Uh, okay, it, I know it's, it's written in the literature that you should remove it after skeletal maturity. But in my practice, I removed only two cases when the arthroiris implant moved and caused pain. All patients that are doing yeah. well, I didn't yeah. remove the implant. So if it is painful or complicated, you remove it. Yes. Otherwise, you don't remove it. Xavi, how frequent do we remove Same. this? Not often, not often. Same opinion. Often. Only yeah. which cause some problem. If not, not necessary yeah. to remove. Okay, the same for me, I think we shouldn't remove it unless it is painful or complicated. And usually painful arthrosis comes from residual uh, oversized implant. This is the most frequent cause of pain. And if you have still residual equinus or tight tendon Achilles, or if you do overcorrection uh, by making varus uh, malalignment, this will cause lateral foot pain. Uh, this is my first case. Uh, I will move quickly to the second case because we are running short of time. Uh, this is another case of uh, adolescence flat foot. He is nine years old boy. Uh, he has foot pain on running uh, and he has recurrent ankle uh, sprain. Uh, and when you look at this X-ray, you will have the same picture of valgus here. Tiptoeing, there is no much correction. And here is the video of the patient. So uh, my question to the participants, uh, what is the diagnosis of this case? Can you write on the chat, please? What's the diagnosis of this case? Mm -hmm. The participants, can you write it down? Yeah, right. this is rigid pis planus, which may be a tarsal coalition, which may be peroneal spastic flat foot. So uh, my question to the panel, is there is a difference between peroneal spastic flat foot and between tarsal coalition? Yes. Uh, uh, Dr. Am? Yes. Uh, the, uh, uh, both of them by examination are the same, but I think yeah. the pathology is, is quite different. In tarsal coalition, there is a bar joining two adjacent tarsal bones preventing the, the, inver the, the inversion. Uh, but in uh, in peroneal spastic uh, flat foot, we, we 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 don't find this bar, but we still have rigid uh, subtalar joint, and the pathology may be just uh, spasm in the peroneal tendons, or there is maybe if there is fibrous bar that we we don't see by any of the X-ray or the MRI. The pathology. Osama, you yeah. meaning clinical difference, not radiologic. Clinical. Is what I understand. Uh, yes. Yeah. No, I mean clinical and also uh, as pathology. I mean the pathology. What about clinical, Maya Mukhtar? Can you answer? Uh, in, 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 in tarsal coalition, there is a bony bar between the telus and the calcaneus blocking the motion of the subtalar joint. This is the pathology. In peroneal spastic flat foot, uh, there is spasm of the abductors and dorsi flexors um, preventing any motion in the subtalar joint. The, the, the differentiation is not always easy, especially uh, that if the CT cuts are not taken properly with thin cuts at the subtalar joint, you may see coalition in case that there is no coalition and may not see a coalition when there is a coalition. Uh, the other difference is that with general anesthesia, a patient yes. with peroneal spastic blood foot, the foot after general anesthesia, 
moves supple, moves completely. The supplementary joint moves completely, but in tarsal coalition, it doesn't move. Yeah, Sam. Yeah, answer. I think this answer is the correct answer. Uh, like uh, Amr Farouk has said, the pathology is different, although both of them are rigid, but one of them is due to peroneal spasm, and the other is due to bony bar. And the differentiation clinical is very difficult. Uh, radiology can differentiate, but sometimes you may miss a bar, and you cannot see it if you don't do the CT scans, CT scan properly. Sometimes the uh, bar is fibrous bar, and you cannot see it. So the anesthesia examination is very important. It was patient with peroneal spastic flat foot, you see it flexible uh, uh, immediately after he takes the anesthesia. But the management of these cases is really is difficult. And I think we can discuss it uh, in another uh, session because we are running short of time. So uh, my question also to uh, the panel, why, why the patient with uh, rigid peace planus complains frequently from recurrent sprain? Wow. So, uh, yeah. Chevy? Yeah. yeah, because there are a limitation of the mobility of the subtalar joint. Great. So the patient, when he has twist of his ankle, the subtalar joint is not mobile. He cannot make reflex correction. So he complains of frequent recurrent pains, and this is the most common complaint. Here is the radiological views of the patient. You see the merry angle, and you see here in this AB view. Uh, my question to the uh, uh, to the audience. Uh, uh, this is a tailored and regular coverage. It's a, a little bit big, it's up to 40 degrees of tailor head coverage. 40% of the tailor head is not covered here. So uh, my question to the audience right now, uh, do you need any additional X-ray views for this case or you are satisfied with these two views and you are happy with that? So any additional X-ray views do you want to ask for? Axial view, right? I agree. It can help also. And gray, okay. Oblique views, okay. Thank you, Dr. Hisham Abdullah. I think oblique views sometimes are very important. Of course, axial view can show you the calcinia coalition, telocalcinia. But a lot of us miss the oblique views, which are important, and the oblique view for this patient. Can you tell me? What do you see here right now in the oblique view? Yeah. Well, we are seeking, we are seeing clearly now a calcunavicular bar, which is a big bar. And when we ask a CT scan for this patient, we can see the part here. It's a very uh, large part blocking the motion. So now we have a rigid piece planus due to calcunavicular bar which is the most common cause of uh, a tarsal coalition. And now, what are the treatment options for this patient? I will give you options. Who will go only for excision of coalition? Uh, who will go for excision of coalition with arthroesis? Uh, who will go for excision of coalition with medial displacement calcinian osteotomy? And who will go for excision and the events osteotomy? I see now most of you answer excision with arthrosis. Uh, okay, my question to the panel, uh, which one do you prefer? Uh, anyone want to answer? Coalition plus arthrosis. Plus arthrosis, okay, Mukhtar. So, how old is the patient, Dr. Osama? Sorry. It's 12 years old. Ah, okay. So I can do resection of the coalition and arthroiresis or excision of coalition and corrective osteotomy. Great, advanced osteotomy. Okay. Uh, I'm Rafaru, which one? Uh, I think uh, I am nine, nine years older, Torsen. Excision nine. of coalition and arthroiresis. Arthroiresis, I think in this age. Nine years old? Yeah, yeah, nine years old. Because well, the, component, the, component, the component of abduction is not very severe. And yeah. Reason. Well, uh, is this, as you hear the audience, I, I, I want to tell you, now there is a controversy again. There is a debate 
should we do excision of coalition? We all agree that we have to excise the coalition, but the correction of four foot abduction and the heel, you can see here, it's a matter of controversy. Some of us go for arthuresis, some of us go for events. As I told you, I depend on the amount of tailor head coverage, and in this case, it was 40, so it is borderline. But for this particular case, I choose because I felt the four foot abduction is a little bit uh, high, 40 degrees. So I choose to do for this patient Evans osteotomy. And as you know, Evans is a lateral column lensing osteotomy. And we have to put a wedge or a wedge plate to correct the lateral column. Uh, the location of osteotomy may be controversial. Most of us like to do it between the anterior middle facet. I know my colleague Mohammed Mukhtar with Hinterman had a paper uh, doing it in a more posterior position in the angle of Jason between the middle and posterior facets in order to prevent translation of the anterior fragment. Both options are quite uh, right, but I prefer this uh, uh, procedure between anterior and posterior facets. And after we correct, we have to put a bone graft or uh, we have to put a wedge plate. And in this case, we have uh, already graft is present, which is a bar. I opened the lateral approach. You can see how much limitation is present. And the bar here is present. I cut the bar with the power saw. And I take this piece of bone and I reserve it for using it as graft later on uh, with the events osteotomy. Of course, after you have to remove, after you remove the, uh, uh, the bar, you have to make for uh, these patients uh, something to prevent the recurrence of coalition, like putting wax or non-absorbable materials like proline mesh or Teflon or something like that. In this case, I put wax. Then we start to make the osteotomy. The osteotomy, usually we go one centimeter Behind here, after we have removed the uh, coalition, you can see the uh, coalition removed completely. The osteotomy, I do it uh, one and a half centimeter from the articular surface. I usually put this Hinterman distractor. It's a very helpful tool to allow you to distract the osteotomy site while you are working. Uh, it's much better than using the uh, laminar spreader. You can see how much it opens like that. And then I put my uh, plate and I can put the piece of bone as graft in this uh, space. We have these wedge plates or wood plates which help you to keep the osteotomy site like that. Of course, one of the common complication is upward translation of the fragment. You, can, uh, you have to check this and you have to avoid this because it is a frequent complication while you are doing this procedure. And here is the post-operative X-ray you can see how much correction of the tailor head coverage with events osteotomy. You can see how much correction of the first uh, metatarsal and tailor axis coverage here. Uh, thank you. These are my two cases. And thank you very much. Thank you, Sam, for your fantastic presentation and discussion. And I want to thank our audience for their You hear me? Uh, no. Uh, okay. What is the difference between arthroiresis and the calcaneus stoppa technique? Stoppa technique. Yeah, a stoppa technique or calcaneus locking technique is to put a screw which prevent eversion of the sub uh, tailor joint. Of course, I, I, I did some cases with this stoppa technique or with using this uh, screw. Uh, it's I didn't like it too much. First, it's painful for the patient. Second, it's mechanical. It depends on uh, uh, hitting of the screw to the lateral process of the talus. So it's always painful for the patient. And commonly, it's broken, and you have to remove it later on. So I don't like the uh, uh, sinus side uh, blocking procedures. I like the self-locking screws, put it inside because there is no tension on the implant. The implant is in the center. It can withstand with pairing. Uh, rarely it's broken now. Uh, and I, I, you can ask also the panel, uh, what do you think, Xavi, uh, stop that technique putting this screw, lateral screw? Yeah, this was an old technique, was described by a Spanish man. 
in the 60s, but I have not experienced with the calcaneal stop. And I prefer clearly the arteriosis for, for child and not the calcaneal stop. Yes. Was uh, Recaredo, uh, the name of the, of the guy that described the technique is Recaredo Alvarez. Okay. Yeah. He was diet some years ago. But I, I think I, I am not uh, enthusiastic with this technique, with the calcaneal yeah. stop. Not really. The second question and the last one for you, sir. Can, can we consider even procedure, a surgical procedure to correct all the deformities of the flat feet by one procedure? Of course not. Even procedure uh, has a limited uh, power to correct severe valgus deformities uh, alone. Uh, of course, medial displacement cal calcaneal osteotomy is better in correction of severe valgus deformities than even procedure. I think the matter is to choose the proper procedure for the proper patient. Uh, and as we mentioned in our take home message, if you have whole foot abduction with valgus here and they are mild, in this case, you can use Evans procedure. If you have uh, uh, arthrosis is alternative in a less age group, uh, but within a limit to the tailored head and coverage. Uh, if you have mainly valgus heel, you have to choose medial displacement calcaneus osteotomy. If you have purely forefoot abduction, you have to use Evans osteotomy. Uh, so I think you have to choose a kind of osteotomy which is suitable to your patient. The message is there is no single procedure to correct all uh, the deformities, as, yeah. as in Hanlux valgus, as you know. Uh, now we will shift to uh, my friend Muhammad Mukhtar. Uh, he will present uh, to us, I think, two cases, Yeah, Muhammad, for Tarsar Coalition, because the time now is going. Okay? Okay. Uh, thank you, Dr. Atif. And I'd like to thank Dr. Osama uh, for his great effort to organize this webinar. He was very enthusiastic. He was pushing us all the time to communicate, to do proba before we, we, we go on, on uh, live. So thank you very much, Dr. Osama. And for his great cases and Dr. Chavi's cases, uh, thank you very much for the nice cases and nice discussion. I hope I can do the same, as good as your presentations. Um, so now uh, I will talk about another variant of, uh, of flat food deformity. This is a 15 years old female that came complaining of unilateral pain deformity. Pain started two years before presentation. She has hind foot valgus, which cannot be passively corrected, and forefoot abduction, as you see here, and arch collapse. You can see the difference between the right foot and the left foot. She has pain, medial, and lateral. Now, I'd like to discuss with you some points on this clinical presentation. First point, and the great uh, discussion point with the, with the family. Uh, the patient, they say always, you say that the patient has a congenital problem uh, with abnormal uh, co connection between two bones, tarsal coalition, like the case of Dr. Osama. Then they say, no, she was completely normal with no pain until the age of 12. So, is this the usual presentation? Yes, this is the usual presentation. The pain of the tenocalcaneal bar or the coalition starts when the bar starts to ossify. So usually in the first decade, there is no symptoms. I have never seen a patient with symptomatic tenocalcaneal bar in the first decade, always in the second decade. So this is the usual uh, age of presentation. Uh, she has the second point. She has hind foot valgus, which cannot be passively corrected, and forefoot abduction. So this is the important point. The hind foot valgus cannot be passively corrected, like the second case Dr. Osama presented. So now we have rigid flat foot, rigid flat foot. We have to think about tarsal coalition or peroneal spastic flat foot. We discussed this before. Third point, she has pain medial and lateral. So please, I will give you one minute to write your explanation why a patient with a telocalcaneal bar complains of a medial pain and a lateral pain in the shed. And Dr. Atif can tell me what the participants said. 
Ah, oh, yes. Yeah. I am waiting. Subfibular impingement. Okay. Secondary sinus tarsi. Medial uh, pain due to the coalition microfracture. Yes. So they are, they are clever participants. Uh, the patient usually has medial pain because of stress fractures in the bar. And in many cases, when the patients do MRI, you find bone marrow edema in the bar. So this stress fractures and stress injuries in the bar, and this is the cause of the medial pain. The lateral pain is due to sinus tarsi impingement from the valgus hind foot position. Other types of presentation is recurrent instability, as Dr. Osama said before, recurrent ankle sprain. Any other comments from the panel about the clinical picture? Yes, and the explanation the, of the symptom? Uh, perineal spasm. Yes, sometimes there is perineal spasm. Dr. Osama, Dr. Chavi, Dr. Am, any comments or should we go on? Yeah, yeah, I think it's the same answer. Okay. Yeah, right. Yeah. The differential diagnosis we managed before, so it's a tarsal coalition or a perineal spastic flat foot. So, next step. What are the required investigations? The required investigations, as Dr. Osama presented, weight-bearing x-rays. So please, weight-bearing x-rays. Anybody in the exam writes foot, radiographs, AP, and lateral, without mentioning standing is wrong answer. So standing, AP, and lateral x-ray to measure the deformity and the angles Dr. Osama mentioned, the second is oblique view for a calcaneo navicular coalition. These are the basic, first three basic investigations. But what is the best method to, to confirm the presence of the talocalcaneal coalition? So Dr. Osama mentioned that the calcaneo navicular coalition is seen in the oblique view. But of the talonavicular coalition, the talocalcaneal coalition, what is the best method to confirm the presence of the coalition? I will give you 30 seconds to answer. Uh, CT, CT, CT scan, CT scan, CT, CT, CT. The okay. answers, all the answers are CT. Okay, so. But uh, one, when uh, our colleagues say lateral view. And one of them said MRI. <laughs> okay, so, so let's. Yes, CT, finished. CT scan is a right answer, but incomplete answer. So because many, many, many doctors, many colleagues don't know how to order the, the CT and how to look at the CT. So you know that some centers, some centers do the CT axial cuts only. So you cannot see the coalition in the axial cut. So you have to order a CT axial, coronal, and sagittal with thin coronal cuts at the level of the subtalar joint. This is very important because without this, you can miss the coalition. So axial, coronal, and sagittal with thin coronal cuts at the subtalar joint. And here you can see the coalition. It's very clear. If the cuts are wide, then you can one cut be behind the coalition, one cut in front of the coalition, and there is no coalition. And you know, many, many uh, we have, I, I need to answer uh, Chavi and you and uh, um, about how frequent you order MRI for cases of tarsal coalition. I, I usually don't. I usually I wait for X-ray yeah. and CT. I don't know, Dr. Chavi. Yeah, I usually do, but I think I agree that it's more important the CT than the MRI. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So MRI is not important. Okay, Pam. I think we, we can see, but usually can, patients arrive with the MRI now because yeah. we yeah. can order we can order MRI only if 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 there is rigid flat foot, and we have done uh, CT in all cuts, and we still don't find uh, definite bar. So I think in this case we may order MRI for fibrous coalition. Fibrous. Yes. yes. Yeah. Okay. In the letter, okay. In the lateral X-ray, we can see this sign. This is one of my patients with a very clear C sign. I have never seen a C sign like this. So very clear C sign. So this C sign is suggestive of a telocalcaneal coalition, but is not 100% reliable. 
because in some patients with severe vulgus with flexible flat foot, they may be overlap between the telus and calcaneus, and you can see the C sign. But if it is uh, matching with the history, it's a very important sign, C sign, denoting telocalcaneal correlation. So there are tricks, some tricks in, in reading the CT of the patient with telocalcaneal correlation. First, this is one of them patient. Please exclude double bar. This patient has a telocalcaneal bar and a calcaneonavicular bar. So you have to be sure that there is no double coalition. Some say it's telocalcaneal coalition, sometimes it's a combined telocalcaneal and telonavicular. Another trick is that not all the coalition are the same. This is in the middle, the classic way we see the bony bar in the middle facet. But in some cases, it's like this. This is not normal. This is coalition where the joint line is very oblique here. And this is not a normal, normal telocalcaneal joint. So this is a variant of the coalition. Another variant is this variant with complete bony fusion between the telus and calcaneus. So not all coalition are the same in the CT. You have to be careful in reading the X-ray. This CT like this came to me with a report, normal CT with no coalition from the radiologist and it's telocalcaneal coalition. So very important trick. You, have, you know more than the radiologist in many times. So now we know the patient has a telocalcaneal coalition. She is 14 years old or 15 years old and she has vulgus hind foot, four foot abduction, no motion in the subtalar joint. What's the treatment plan? So classically, everybody says, there is the problem is a telocalcaneal coalition, so we do resection of the bar. Who of the, who of the panel agree with resection of the bar only as a treatment in this patient? Dr. Dr. Chabi? I, I could, could see the, the weight bearing X-ray, please. Ma, uh, I think it's that. not included, but it, there is arch collapse and four foot abduction. Four foot abduction. Yes. Probably we About 20 need, degrees uncovered. Yeah, probably we need to correct also this uh, point, and it's not only necessary to perform the resection of the collision. Of course, we are agree about this, and probably we need to add uh, some uh, Evans osteotomy. Mm -hmm. Doctor which, which age has the patient? Fifteen. She is fifteen. Yes. Yes. Uh, yeah. Yeah. I, I usually, if you have uh, co combined deformity with I have to correct the fault. If you remove only the part, the patient may have more pain after removal of the part without correction of the deformity on the medial side, because now he has more and more deformity will be seen because the joint is mobile and he will complain of medial foot pain more than before the operation. So if you have a bar with valgus here for foot abduction, you have to resect with correction. Yes. So th this is completely true. In my first experience with telocalcaneal coalition in 2011 and 12, I find that many patients are not satisfied with resection. I, that was the classic treatment, just the resection of the coalition and the patient will be okay in the patient 12, 13. And then many patients are not satisfied. Then I started to change my philosophy. Uh, and I find this described in a paper. So, this is the title of the paper. So taking out the tarsal coalition was easy, but now the, flat, the foot is even flatter. So no coalition, the coalition is removed, but the foot is worse now. And why is this? Because the tendo Achilles is attached laterally because of the valgus heel. The peroneal tendons are spastic, usually in cases of tarsal coalition, as you know. And now you have a mobile joint. So the, these forces pull the subtalar joint more, pain, more and more pain. So the, the concept is excision of the, of the coalition only is not a good treatment if the patient has a deformity. So we have to do resection and correction of the deformity. So when I revised the literature, they were, they were writing this in other way, in other uh, words. The concept was not clear, but this in, in this paper, in Foot and Ankle International 2006, what was the conclusion here? Telocalcaneal coalition, unresponsible to conservative treatment, are best managed by coalition excision. So that was the standard treatment. 
although outcomes are not good as those of calcaneo navicular resection, older presentation, larger coalition, and increased hind foot valgus may be predictive of poorer outcome. So they realized at that time that patients with deformity have poorer outcome than patients without deformity. But they didn't figure out what to do. To do what to do is to correct the deformity. Now this is clear. And this was the work of me and do, to my friend, Dr. Osama. And this paper was published in 2014 with coalition resection and medial displacement calcaneal osteotomy for treatment of telocalcaneal coalition. And we found greater improvement in patients with deformity, with coalition and correction of deformity than our previous experience with excision alone. That was a great step in our department. Then I went one step further. Not only calcaneal osteotomy is to remove the coalition, and then I correct the flat foot as if a flexible flat foot. If there is valgus, I do medial translation calcaneal osteotomy. Abduction, I do lateral column lengthening. Tight gastrocnemius, I lengthen the gastrocnemius. Tight perineal tendon, I lengthen the perineal tendon. Residual forefoot supination, I do cotton osteotomy. So everything, I now remove the bar and then manage the deformity completely personalized as the, as we mentioned before so uh, medial translation for valgus lateral column lengthening for foot abduction gastrocnemius recession perineal tendon recession and cotton osteotomy i think it's now we mentioned everything about the medial translation and for foot abduction and we should talk more about cotton osteotomy cotton osteotomy to to, the, to our participant is a dorsal opening wedge of the medial cuneiform dorsal opening wedge of the medial cuneiform. So in the beginning, the patient has hind foot valgus. To make, to make his foot plantigrade, he made the compensatory forefoot supination. Now, when you correct the hind foot, this residual uh, supination is there. Another point is that lateral column lengthening causes some supination. It improves the abduction, but it causes some supination. So, my concept, I will discuss this with the panel. After I co uh, correct the hind foot, I then test the forefoot. I do the simulated weight-bearing position. If the first and fifth the metatarsal head are not in the same level, I add a cotton osteotomy. Because if you leave the patient in supination, he will try to put the medial ray on the ground and then will cause recurrence of the valgus. And with time, I now have low threshold to do a cotton osteotomy. What's your opinion, Dr. Osama and Dr. Chavi and Dr. Ham? Yeah, I see. After, uh, after I correct the hind foot, uh, as you do, I assess the forefoot that I see if there is supination or not. Before I go to cotton osteotomy, I test the uh, tightness of tendon Achilles because some supination may improve if you make gastrocnemius recession and some improve with that. Uh, so I test before I go to cotton, I do the silver scoil test and I see if there is tightness of the uh, gastrocnemius or tendo Achilles and I do release. Then I do reassessment again for foot subination. If I find subination of the foot, in this case, I do cotton osteotomy. The trick, the trick if you perform uh, 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 flexion of the, of the knee and you correct the supination, of the forefoot, I think is enough to do the lengthening. Yeah. If not, the indication is the cotton. Yes. So great. So, so for the patient, I did resection, medial translation, calcaneal osteotomy, lateral column lengthening, cotton osteotomy, gastrocnemius recession, and peroneal tendon recession. If I feel with forefoot with lateral column lengthening, the peroneal tendons are tight. I open above the lateral malleolus at the level of the musculotendinous junction and do lengthening of the perineal tendon the same way I do with the gastrocnemius resection. Which, which perineal tendon, Muhammad? The previous or the longus? Or previous. previous. Previous, and if the longus is tight, I, 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 but I start with the previous. If the longus is tight, I remove it as well. So, previous is more deforming the force. Mm. Yes. yes. So this is the concept excision of the coalition and correction of the deformity. Now we come to some um, tips. 
this is the section. I open directly over the sustentaculum. I open directly over the sustentaculum. Medially, I identify the joints of the tibialis posterior, flexor digitorum longus, and flexoralis longus. Then you find the bar like this. It's a bony bar, bony bar connecting the joint. You have to remove it carefully, step by step, without causing a fracture to the sustentacular. You have to move it carefully, step by step, until you see articular cartilage like this. If you don't see articular cartilage like this, you are sure that you didn't remove the bar completely. So you have to see articular cartilage. You have to remove until you remove the, until you see articular cartilage and until the subtalar joint is completely mobile. Okay, so it's very important to the operation. Then you can see here the bar that was in, in the, you saw it before in the CT is completely removed here. This is the CT after the, after the operation and the sustentaculum is not injured. So the sustentaculum is okay. You go and remove, remove, remove until you see the articular cartilage at this point. So, and all this is removed. And you can see removed, here is removed. So complete removal of the subtalar joint, of the, of the telocalcaneal bar. Now this is the patient two years after, you know, after, the, um, after operation with a nice correction of all deformity. And Do this you use some interposition? Do you use some uh, kind of tissue as interposition between the, the bar? I usually, the, I, usually bar? Put, I usually put just a small amount of bone wax on the opposing surfaces. Bone wax. Can you, Can you hear me? Yes. Yes, yes we hear you. Uh, this is this is the the X-ray, and this was small stress fracture of the talus uh, during removal of the bar. I was, you know, to feel safe, I fixed it to the screw, but it was very small crack in the in the tailor head. So, the conclusion is deformity correction with telocalcaneal coalition resection gives good results in symptomatic adolescence in the short term follow up. This is our work. Longer follow-up is needed, and comparison to other possible treatment options is needed. So now I'd like to ask the panel, are there any other treatment options? Yeah. But sometimes when I have uh, a child uh, around the street and maturity, 16 years old or 15 years old, with large coalition and the joint in the CT scan is uh, a little bit uh, damaged or narrow joint space, I think infusion for these cases. So I think fusion is an alternative. Hmm. Other options, if the, if the coalition is only small in the, in the middle facet, the posterior facet is okay, and the patient is 14, 15, are there other options other than resection and osteotomies? Maybe resection and arthroresis. Resection and arthroresis? Yes. What's your opinion, Javi, about this? No, I, I, I prefer I prefer uh, resection and osteotomy. Mm, Dr. Osama? In adults, in adults are the disease. Yeah, I can, in some cases, I do resection with arthroiresis if it is a small point. Uh, still, is a range of arthroiresis power of correction. I can do arthroiresis with resection, and I have some cases I have done, and it's good, yeah. Yes, there's another option I presented. This is the second case. And uh, we do now a uh, prospect. Uh, Mukhtar, we are short of time. Mukhtar, okay, yes. we are short of time. Two uh, minutes. Please go, go fast because okay. to, have, to, have, to have space for Amr, please. Okay, to have yes. space for Amr, okay? Two minutes. Two minutes. Please, okay? Uh, yes, yes. We have now a randomized prospective randomized control studies between resection and osteotomies and resection and arthroiresis. And here we can see. This patient with hind foot valgus that's fixed, four foot abduction, and this is the telecalcaneal coalition. And now we did the section of the coalition and the arthroiresis. And this is the CT showing complete resection of the coalition and the arthroiresis in place. And this is the clinical photo of the patient with correction of the deformity and the arch. So I think it's an option 
the concept is to do the excision of the coalition and the correction of the deformity. How to correct the deformity? Osteotomies are the mainstay of treatment. Coalition may be, uh, arthroerases may be an option, but this needs a longer follow-up. Thank you very much. Thank you, Muhammad. Thank you, Muhammad. Now, uh, before we shift to Dr. Amr Farrou, there is uh, just two questions. Uh, the first one, what is the role of casting in tarsal coalition? Casting? Uh, alone? Yes. Uh, no. Uh, no rule. No rule. Yes, <laughs> say no. <laughs> say no rule. <laughs> The second question, in Evans osteotomy, do you, do you osteotomize two cortices or just the lateral cortex? Uh, the, the, med, the lateral cortex, and I weaken the medial cortex in order to open. So I have to weaken the medial cortex a little bit. Okay, thank you. Um, now it's your uh, role. Uh, you will discuss with us uh, a case of accessory navicular bone. Am I right? Yes. Okay. I have shared my screen. Is it okay right now? Yeah. Okay. Yes. Yeah. I know nice we are. We are <laughs> <laughs> I know we are out of time. So this is only one case about uh, accessory navicular bone. This is a male patient, 33 years old, and he has a history of trauma. Four months ago and he was treated conservatively, put in posterior below knee slab for two weeks, but he is still in pain and he still can't walk properly. On examination, there is very localized tenderness at this point. Is, is the arrow clear for the audience? Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes. And this is the X-ray standing x-rays for the foot, mm -hmm. lateral and anthroposterior view. And here we can see in the anthroposterior view of the foot, this accessory bone. Okay, uh, I need uh, from the audience to tell me, what is the probable diagnosis after doing this x-ray? Is this a medial ankle sprain? or is it a tibialis posterior injury, or is it only the presence of the accessory navicular bone? Dr. Atif, any answers? Three. The answer is three, number three. All the audience uh, tell uh, number three. Yes, so now shifting to the panel, is the presence of the accessory navicular bone alone a cause of pain like this for the panel, please. Doctor. Yeah, of course. Uh, accessory navicular can cause pain by itself without uh, tenosynovitis of TBS posterior because uh, and this usually occurs after trauma or some sprains because the uh, synestosis between the accessory bone and the main navicular uh, comes injured and it causes pain and mobility on the accessory bone and causes pain. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Some, uh, our colleagues say if there is a fracture of the uh, accessory navicular bone. Yes. Yeah. Yes. What is the next step? Conservative management, maybe in the form of physiotherapy, or surgical management, or I still need further investigations. For the audience. Please answer on the chat. Yes. Number one, one, three. If we need further investigations in the form of what, please? Yeah. Yes. Who said number three, please tell us which investigation he want. One, CT. He tell, he tell us CT by some uh, colleagues, uh, MRI. Okay. MRI. Ultrasound. Now, okay. Carry okay. On. Now, I think there is still something missing in the examination itself. Uh, the accessory navicular is like, uh, now we can deal with it like uh, the, the, the previous uh, lecture of Dr. Mukhtar, 
tarsal coalition. Does the tarsal coalition always mean that the patient has a hind foot vulgus or a foot deformity? And the same for the accessory navicular bone. Does the presence of the accessory navicular bone always mean that the patient has a flat foot? So I think we, we usually deal with the accessory navicular bone as a part of the flat foot deformity. So most patients of the, uh, of the accessory navicular bone have flat foot deformity. If we continue the examination of the patient, we'll find that this patient has already collapse of the medial arch and bilateral hind foot valgus more severe on the left side. So by continuing this examination, I think we all now uh, shift to the answer of surgical management. If we choose the surgical management, what will be the appropriate operation here? Just excision of the accessory navicular or excision plus correction of the flat foot or excision plus tibialis posterior reinforcement or all of the above excision plus correction of flat foot plus correction or reinforcement of the tibialis posterior. Can I know the answers, please? Uh, different answers, four, two, one, three, four, 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 two. Okay, uh, answers are different, so let us move forward. If we choose only excision of the accessory navicular, if I excise the accessory navicular bone, and then I will get a scar like, like this. And, and with this patient of the severe loss of the, of the arch, of the medial arch, if he walks after the operation, the scar will be there, as we can see. And if the scar is here and the patient is moving, the, 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 the scar be, we, will be nearly plantar. And we have done uh, this in, uh, in, in my early cases, when I have done only excision of the accessory navicular bone, with these cases of severe flat foot, the pain becomes more than before the operation because the, 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 the foot is getting flatter and the scar is literally under the plantar surface of the patient. So I think the choice of excision only is not appropriate and we all should go to excision plus correction of the flat foot, correction of the flat foot here we can use all the osteotomies which were previously explained by our, by our colleagues in the form of medial translation, calcaneal osteotomy, or if there is severe foot abduction, we can add also Evans osteotomy. And if there is residual supination, we can add cotton osteotomy. So what about the tibialis posterior tendon? This patient is just 33 years old. What about the tibialis posterior tendon? I think we have to assess. Here I'm saying that the accessory navicular, if it is associated with severe flat foot, it is a must to correct the flat foot with the excision of the accessory navicular. What about assessment of the tibialis posterior tendon? The assessment of the tibialis posterior tendon has to start preoperatively in the form of assessing the power of the tibialis posterior this may, may, may give me some idea about if there is tenosynovitis in the tibialis posterior tendon associated with the presence of the accessory navicular, like Dr. Osama said. And the main assessment is intraoperatively because the insertion of the tibialis posterior is just into the navicular bone. Sometimes when we remove the accessory navicular bone, we remove a part of the insertion of the tibialis posterior. So if I remove the accessory navicular bone, I have to assess that the tibialis posterior is still inserted strongly into the rest of the navicular bone. If I find that I have done severe weakness for the tibialis posterior, I have to reinsert it into the, the rest of the navicular bone using either transosseous sutures or even I can remove it completely and reinsert it using an anchor. My question to the, to the panel, Dr. Osama, are you doing yes. this frequently? 
uh, I do it routinely uh, with every case of accessory removal, uh, accessory bone uh, removal. In every case, I have to reattach uh, the tibialis superior like this because a significant part of the tendon is inserted in this uh, accessory bone. So when you remove it, you remove the insertion and you have to reattach it. One more thing uh, is in some cases of very large accessory navicular, you can find even the spring ligament attached to the accessory bone. And you have to check if you injured part of the navicular attachment of the spring ligament, you have to uh, fix it again. So I do it routinely in every case, reattachment with ankle after removal. Yeah. I think I think it's important yeah. in this case of flat foot to know the high price test for to know if the tendon is uh, present some rupture or not. Usually not. There are an avicular accessory bone. And in this case, we remove a flap and it's a flap of tendon in the insertion of the navicular but it's a flap with tendon and some fragments of bone of navicular and cuneiform. We remove the flap. We could remove, after to remove the flap, we could remove the accessories by, by the lateral part of the flap. You could remove the accessories bone. And after we, are, we, we reattachment the flap with bone and tendon more distally to reattach with more tension the tendon. But it's a flap with tendon, part of navicular, and part of cuneiform. And we reattach. And you use an anchor to, for reattachment of the tendon? Yes, yes. In childs, you could use only a needle for to form shooters transosseus with a needle, with a uh, But in adults, it's best to use. Uh, uh, Dr. Mukhtar? You routinely uh, re, uh, use an anchor to reattach the tendon? An anchor or a transosseous suture. I routinely use this. Okay, okay I'm uh, carry. Uh, this, is, this, this is what was done. Excision of the navicular bone plus medial translation and reinsertion of the anchor of the of the tendon using transosseous sutures only, and then uh, uh, calcaneal osteotomy, medial translation osteotomy for the calcaneus to correct the hind foot valgus. So yeah. our take home message is that the accessory navicular bone is not the single pathology. A thorough examination of the foot is a must. And if the accessory navicular bone is associated with severe flat foot, excision alone is not enough and correction of the flat foot is a must. Intraoperative assessment of tibialis posterior tendon is important and reinsertion using an anchor, uh, most of it, of us do it routinely. Finished, Tom? Yes, yeah. thank you. Thank you, thank you a lot. Uh, uh, at the end, I want to thank uh, Dr. Chaffee uh, for his uh, fruitful uh, discussion in our webinar. I want uh, to thank my big team, uh, the panel, uh, Dr. Osama Shazli, Dr. Mohammed Mukhtar, and Dr. Amr Farooq. Uh, I want to thank Elixir Company for their uh, sponsoring our webinars. And thanks all the audience and our colleagues that they stay with us till now. Uh, and thank you for everyone.